Ever wondered what an industry retopology workflow looked like? In this video, we will cover the full process of retopology and the decisions that you need to make inside of the industry. Just in case you forgot and to support you, I've made the trifecta of free retopology PDFs. You can download those below. Hi, I'm Virtus and welcome to 3D Mutiny, where we retopologize 32 bag slots and get paid doing it. Well, hopefully at some point, I believe in you. So we're gonna take this high poly asset that I've sculpted and we're gonna turn it into a games mesh using Quadra out of Maya. So I'm gonna go over the fundamentals of that. We obviously know we can't take a high poly like this straight into a games engine because it would crash. We have to make the low poly representation and bake all that information down. To a certain extent, we can't actually take this high poly straight into Maya sometimes because it causes crashes. So I'm gonna take you over uh, how we make some guides or representations of those high polys, basically build low poly around that. And this is a really cool asset because there's lots of interesting features here. For example, what bits can we combine together and bake onto the same low poly? Common questions are going to be, uh, where do I separate certain low poly assets? Can I have them floating? And how's the whole baking process going to proceed? So I'll show you a couple of decision making that I do when approaching an object like this. When it comes to my own workflow, I like to set things up very methodically. That's going to help us when we go into retopology. And it's also going to save us a lot of time. That thing of measuring twice and cutting once, it's the same sort of theory. So here's an example of a game ready game character, sort of like current gen. We've also got the addition of the bag that we're going to be going through. So a couple of comments of where retopology and quad draw is positioned in the industry. Obviously, when you're learning, you really want to understand how you freshly retopologize something, especially with quad draw. When you get more experience, you can potentially outsource that to other artists uh, and definitely in this industry or studio positions and my role as an art director I'd look to outsource that to other studios or maybe individual artists that cost a little bit less. A couple of questions I saw on discord and answering those. So one of the questions was um, pretty topology versus sort of functional topology. So it's a good question and I see it debated. I think one of the points of contention is that people will post these topology and they're very proud of it because it looks nice and it flows well and part of that question was how much time should you be spending on it realistically. As an artist the answer is you shouldn't really be spending too much time as long as you're ticking a couple of boxes. So as long as it's following silhouettes, as long as it's making your deformations nice and it's taking up a majority of the volume of your high poly, then it's fine because the games engine doesn't care what it looks like. It's only really looking at verts. And I can take an example of this one. So this character here, parts were retopologized by different artists. Now it's not the best retopology, something that I um, would probably want to go around and fix, but as a submission and receiving it, it's going to work in the games engine. It's got its animation loops in there. So it gives a tick for there and I can just continue on. Sometimes people might get caught in the trap of trying to make pretty topology, the ones that they see on social media, so don't fall into that trap. Another misconception I see a lot is the introduction of triangles. So I think this stems from ZBrush where you're taught to keep things in quads. When it comes to game meshes, it's totally okay to have triangles. Uh, what does happen when we import this into a games engine, it all gets turned into triangles anyway. So each one of these quads is going to be split into two and it's going to be represented in triangles. So we can often use triangles to basically cut in very specific specific silhouettes that we want to see while still maintaining the animation loops and all the deformation that we require. So with this bag, for example, we've got 24 sub tools and that's useful for creating the bag itself. What I like to do is basically combine all these together. And once they're all combined, it's going to be a big high poly mess, might be lagging your computer a bit, but they're all connected in one sub tool, but they're not physically welded together like you would see with the Dynamesh. What that allows us to do is if we come into polyframe, and then what we can do is just turn off the line. It's a very small button here, and that just breaks it up into components. And then we can understand what we're going to be combining and what we're going to be low polying together. Now we could take this. The issues are it's going to be a quite a large file size, which is, is annoying. And also at the same time, the frame rates are going to be a little bit weird. So you can do a GPU when render. What I prefer to do is go through a process of decimation. It's just going to bring all the geometry down, but it's going to keep all the details that we see here. And we're going to use that as a guide to basically draw our quads on top of. So what I suggest doing is keeping all your high polys in, in one folder, your combinations, so all the merge pieces in another. I like to call that ID. And then we're going to have another folder, which is the duplication of this. And this is going to be the, the guide or the decimated version. So to do that what you want to do is select your combined ID and then go into Z plugins and then under decimation master and there's going to be a very useful set of presets so usually what I do is aim it around 75k or 150k that's going to be totally fine for Maya um, if it's a bit more of a complicated detailed asset then you might want to give it more resolution what we're aiming for is when we click that button vaguely looks the same and it keeps its same volume so after I've pressed that 75k it's gone through a process made the decimated version and we've kept all our groups 
shapes here. In the polyframes, you can bring the line back and then you can see what sort of geometry we're working with. So what I'm going to do is export this into Maya and show you a couple of issues that might arise and basically how we fix that. So I'm going to come up to export and export as an FBX. Make sure you set the save as type to FBX and name it. My naming conventions, this is a guide. So usually I go bag underscore guide and then I know the reference. As far as settings go, we have the one that we have selected. So the one highlighted in the sub tools and then everything else is okay. And we're just going to press okay. In Maya by now, hopefully you should know importing. So we've imported the decimated guide. When you do import something like this, really important not to move the high poly that you've already made. And also really important to not edit or move the guide. This is a common workflow for a lot of my students. So they'll just bring the asset straight in and start to work on it. It's going to cause a couple of issues down the line. So let's showcase some of those. It's going to make it a live surface so we can draw on top of it and click this little magnet under the modeling toolkit. And then we can also activate quad draw. It can also be found up here. There's another button and that's use quad draw toggled on and our guide activated. We can start to make a new mesh and click on our guide. That's going to create vertices. And then with shift, we can fill that in by just clicking. This texture might be a bit distracting. So what you can also do is just turn off the material and use the default material. So with the retopology, I'll go through a couple of core fundamentals. There are no hard rules, but there are definitely uh, incorrections of ways to do it. And there are also long winded ways of doing retopology. So as a general rule of thumb, I like to make very big surfaces and then refine those later. So it just involves that looking for the biggest face you can find, drawing four points and then filling that in with a shift. Once you've done that, you can come back to your bigger forms. And then while holding control, you want to insert additional loops. And we're already starting to find some problems here, basically down to our guide mesh that we're going to fix after. If I put an incision here, what usually happens is it should snap to the surface. But in this option, uh, you can see there's a little cross there and it's not letting me do it. And that's because there's an in underlying geometry here. And my is basically getting confused that where it's going to put that guide. So if we can separate this in a way, get confused, it's going to save us a lot of time down the line. So that's one area that an issue can pop up. Also in terms of the guide, obviously when it comes to this section, we can either bridge that and then adjust and add edges for our loops. Still getting the same sort of issues, but I can aim off to the side and then move the pivots and the vertices afterwards. So here you'd make the decision of whether you want this to be one seamless transition or a water type mesh. Think about it like shrink wrapping all your high polys together. Make the decision that you want this to be a little bit higher fidelity and you actually split these two components. So you'd have one asset here and another floating asset, which is the bag, and then they would combine together. There's no correct answer. What I'd say is that there is a better answer. So I would choose to have this as a water type mesh and then the ambient occlusion and the normal map space are going to give the illusion that they are separated. Now, where that's not the case is obviously on this nylon strap. So for example, if I'm drawing some geometry here, I'm going to have to create a lot of vertices. I'm going to have to create a lot of edges fit smoothly to the main mesh. The answer for this one is just to have floating geometry. So it's not actually connected to anything. It's just its own object and it's going to receive its own normal. So an example of that can be seen here. So for example, from a distance, it looks like these two are separated and even the trim looks like it's separated. But what that actually is, is one continuous mesh. And then as we were describing with the nylon, it's kind of floating and vanishing into the mesh, but it's not connected. And then from a distance, we just use textures to give that bump and make it look like it is connected. When we get potentially to this back end and we start drawing geometry, um, it's going to be very hard to get in here. And ideally, we want to make the low poly transition and finish inside of the mesh. And it's going to give a nice effect. But with this camera, everything's going to get in the way. So ideally, we want to split all these components up. Now, it is possible to do that manually in ZBrush. So what we would do is we kind of guide and then we go to right object. So we can double click face and then that's going to expand the selection and then we can separate that object into our outliner and then work on individual bits. But I've been having a lot of trouble actually with frame rates in selecting that. So we can come in here and just double click the face and that's going to expand and select the object itself. And then if we shift and right click or extract it and use it as a separate object and work on them individually. The problem with that is obviously we have to come out of the guide, which is really super annoying. And also the double click don't work. Um, my computer is lagging here a bit with the amount of decimations. It's getting a bit confused. Um, so you don't really want to be unselecting a guide, making new surfaces, coming back again. And what happens when you get to the stage of the way you want to say, make a bit of geometry that is using both of these assets, you then have to recombine them and it's going to take up a lot of time. So all those issues that we went through and a couple of more are going to be eradicated if you spend some time making really nice guides like we're going to do here. I'm going to work on the main strap and basically our decimated version, because it's separated meshes are all split into poly groups. So if you don't have poly groups and it looks like this, you just want to come to the side panel and under poly groups, you want to 
auto group that's going to split it into anything that is a floating geometry so you can click that a couple of times if you don't like the colors what i'm going to do is just turn off the line here because it's a little bit annoying i'm just going to turn this selection rectangle into a selection lasso and with Control shift and a i can basically select and anything that the selection is touching is going to select those poly groups as it's isolated our guides. We can now come to split and then split hidden. We've got two parts. We've got the main strap and the main bag. You'll find that this doesn't have the other symmetrized version. You can bring that along if you want to, if you want to see them both together. Um, an alternative is you can just work on one side and then we mirror it after. That's usually what I prefer just because it's um, less to worry about and it's not doubling up in my, it's not sort of like lagging it about. I'm going to take this strap and then put it into a new folder. That's just a good habit to get into because anytime you do duplications or extractions it's going to be maintained in that strap and that's exactly what we're going to do now looking at this mesh i'm going to have an assessment all the high poly pieces that i want to be contained into one low poly so as a general rule of thumb it's going to be stuff that's uh, very close to each other if you imagine like a tank top on a character ideally we would remesh that all together whereas if you have a shirt that'd be its own floating bit of geometry just on top of the body so holding control and shift i'm going to use the selection rectangle and then i'm going to click all the components that i want Want to combine together so it's a bit backwards it's going to actually hide it so there's this piece i'm going to click once more it's going to hide that section uh the main strap and also the trim that's going to be combined so i also want to pick those two and all the rest of the components are going to be floating bits are going to be uh, made off to the side and replicated so i'll show you how to do that as well so it's the exact same process you can come down to split and then also remember you could even mask this so if you want to mask particular components and split those off you have the ability to do so so for this i'm just going to use split hidden now with this main strap if you remember when we're doing our quad drawing every time that we click there's going to be a bit of a confusion with Maya it's not going to know which surface it's using is it going to use the underlying surface or the trim or is it going to use this big pad um, and that problem gets worse as, as you go along you add more geometry so it gets uh, even more confusing to rectify the issue what I like to do is just merge them all together with a Dynamesh so under geometry we're going to go Dynamesh and the resolution will work out after because it's dependent on size so what the Dynamesh has done here not that it's so clear it's taken that one sub tool with all the floating bits of geometry and it's combined them together and merged them together like so you can see that if you come in with smooth it's acting like a single shrink wrapped version um, and that's indicative of what we're going to do with the low poly we're just going to have one surface that flows over so before moving on what i would do and i do this with every asset i don't assume that it's done it correctly so i'm just going to look for holes and i'm also going to look for any areas that i can maybe potentially fill in with a bit of clay and that will help me when it comes to doing my low poly so say for example um, this is a little bit too deep or it's going to cause issues it's totally fine to come in with something like a clay brush so i could come in with a clay brush and just fill in those sections um, i'll give a better example so this for example is a very complicated guide and decimation like especially if you look on the back there's a mixture of sort of growth bits tentacles the low poly is represented here it's very simple and flat so if you imagine trying to replicate this sort of surface and draw those poly groups imagine trying to quad draw that all on top of here so sometimes what it can be useful to do is just get the clay brush and fill in the sections and almost smooth it away under the assumption that a low poly is just going to flow on top of it or maybe there are really tricky annoying holes that's going to cause issues maybe your vertice gets lost when you click in there so what i usually do is just get a clay fill in all those holes because i'm not going to make low poly holes for each one of those so what you're really looking for is a very smooth and seamless transition of surface that we can start to draw nicely so with the remaining guides i'm not going to export them individually live but i'll show you how i basically approach it and think about this mesh so for example the first piece here the nylon i would definitely stone piece its own sub tool now these buckles and these other plastic buckles are going to be interesting they are used on other parts of the model so when it comes to game characters and game ready meshes whenever we have repetition usually what we like to do is take this piece or high poly sort of off to the side here and then we will construct a low poly around that and then after we've done all the texturing after we've done all the baking we would then place it so it's totally fine to keep these high polys as a bit of a reference guide just so you can see how it's going to look um, but that is an option to save time you can make your low polys off to the side and then reposition them with this sort of hovering strap uh, we've got a bit of overlap and the effect of the nylon going underneath this strap um, and that's the style of the bag and maybe in the game this is going to be removed or it's replaced with something else so that's a conversation that you'd have with uh, one of the art leads or like an art director but because it is that feature i definitely want to separate that low poly individually and have it floating so completely the opposite of what we did up here is where we combined it all together now while it's saving this area here presents quite an interesting opportunity so i'll show that on the other one so while i was splitting those uh how you can save a bit of time if you like how the poly groups are all separated what you can do is just come into split and then group split and it's going to split it all into those colors so that's uh, a little way of 
it's saving some time. So split, group split, undoable operation. And now we have all our individual components on separate subtools. And so here's where the folder is paying its dividends. Everything that we separated is now in this strap unit. So if you hold control and just press these eyes, we just want the strap so far. Also make sure that you don't have anything accidentally hidden within the eyes. So open up the folder and then click the eyes and that's going to show everything inside there. With all these eyes visible and I can also see it on the screen, there's nothing else that's visible. So for example, this cylinder, just to make sure I'm hiding that. Same process of export. Same again, only this time instead of selected, we're going to have visible. So all the eyes that we set up. So we have the imported decimated strap guide here and it's split up into its all separate sub tools. Obviously these have funny naming. So if you want to name all your pieces, go ahead and do that in ZBrush before you export it. Um, personally, I don't usually like to do it just because I can select things when I see them. Um, I find that naming slows me down a bit, keep things into groups and then use up and down on the keyboard to basically select stuff. Uh, just get all the pieces that you had originally made and organization is going to be key. So not necessarily just the naming. You can select all these pieces and then press control G and I would rename this. So I'd call this a strap. Another thing I'd also like you to do is come up to the top right here and with this button, uh, we have some layers. So this little button with the flat plane and the object, and it's going to put all the selected objects here into a layer. Now layers are slightly different, so we can hide all these independently. And then if we want to hide all our guides all at once, we can come down to our layers and press V and it's going to hide and show it. So that's going to be really important for referencing what our low poly looks like if we don't want to see the guides. And also while the guides are as a live surface, we can't necessarily select them. So it's going to be very useful. Of course, you can also rename this guides. An added feature to this is if you press the third button down here, click it a couple of times and come to R, that means it's a rendered piece and we can't select it. So that's also going to be useful. If the guides are ever getting in the way. You can just come down to the layers and then turn this to R and they're not going to. Enter. Okay, so we're starting to set up a, an arsenal of guides that have a lot of different solutions. So we still have the other one that we made. Uh, so if I bring that back with H, it's going to show the full piece and I can hide all the straps. This is just another unit. It's going to be useful if I want to see the model as a whole. You know, how's the low, low poly working? I would show this as a full section, the different components that have been prepared in a way that's going to make it easy for low polling. So if you remember, on this strap, we can bind them all together so that when we use the guides, it's going to be nice and easy. So taking that just as an example, uh, we can make that a live surface and then come to our quad draw. This time, I'm just going to use this button here. So the benefit of how we set it up, obviously, we can draw on the combined decimations, but at the same time, we can still have the other assets visible to see how it looks, uh, but it's not going to interfere with what we were making because they're fundamentally just different objects. And if they're too visually annoying, you can just come down into selection and then press H to hide them. And that's basically going to hide all the pieces that we don't want to see. So you can bring them forth, bring them back. It just means you have all the options when it comes to low polying. So let's completely focus down on this asset and then press control one, and then that's going to isolate it. Turn it into a guide as we've usually done. This time I'm going to press the button up here, come quickly into quad draw. The way I like to approach it, look at it from a distance and think about the major shapes we've got here. So I'm going to make this almost like a, a mobile version of a low poly in certain locations. Obviously we're going to have to have somewhat of a bend there because it is a curved asset. For the time being, I'm just going to skip any step sections like here, go under the assumption that I'll fill that in later. So when I'm doing a low poly, I basically look at the silhouette and try and fill in the biggest square that I can see or the biggest quad. So as this is a curved asset, so just as you would when you're making a game, you want to close up the loop. Um, I like to complete the entire object. So I'll wrap this underneath as well. So also what I like to do with the low poly is I like to complete its full structure before I start putting incisions in. It's going to save me a lot of time. So for this, we're just making it a box, a basic box, and then we can add additional loops to give it its curvature. So you can be fancy with that. Uh, you could potentially come out of quad draw and just extract the whole thing that if you like that sort of workflow. What I prefer is just looking at it from the side and drawing it out. You might find that um, a box might be a bit of an extreme silhouette for this. So what I'm going to do is just create another set of edges that lead about halfway. My preferred method is just holding tab, going over a vertice and then dragging it out. I find that a little bit easier than using uh, the edges to pull things out. So I'm not going to do the whole thing in the interest of time. I've just sort of done this cross section, but looking at the model done complete coverage across this, I start to really zoom into the mesh and just see if the silhouettes are being broken anywhere. So you can see here's our low poly game res version, but the silhouettes are going. Uh, so what I would do is come here and then insert an edge loop. So hold control and then we can just click and that's going to adhere to the surface. Now, if this is all separated with that trim, it would have a chaotic time and they'd sort of go on the inside and then you'd have to repair them. But because um, we set our guides up very nicely with the dyna mesh, that's not going to happen. And then I would just adjust 
adjust every time you put in some loops. I would just adjust them and make sure that they're directed in, in the right place. Again, not too worried about how it looks. It's just how it's going to function. So we could do a couple of those. Now, when I come to the side, obviously that might be a bit too sharp for that kind of silhouette. So it might be an idea to add an additional loop down here. And then we just evenly disperse the bevel. So in games, you do want a lot of bevels. It's going to help you when it comes to baking. And also it's just going to look nice in the engine. Another thing to consider when it comes to retopology is the protection of textures. So obviously we've got a high poly here that has a trim. If this full face was forming, if you imagine the vertices, all these textures would warp and change and it wouldn't look so great. So usually what we do, if there's any opportunity, put a line against a texture seam. The animator and all the deformation and the skinning team are going to have more options when it comes to deforming that bag. And it means that the trim isn't going to stretch in, in weird ways. It'd be the same if you had, imagine you had a badge here and had a lot of writing on it. You ideally want to encirculate that. So that area, because that's a fundamental of um, making retopology. Obviously, um, it doesn't look super smooth, but that can totally go into the game. The game won't complain. It won't say it looks dirty or whatever. Um, maybe it could be a smoothed a little bit more so it's easier for um, skinning. So you can spend as much time as you want on that. Where we approach these areas, um, now we start to further refine. You see, like we left this gap so we could come back to it later. This is just the case. I usually like to just extrude a very little bit and then grab the polys and then drag them onto a location. And then when they go close to each other, they're just going to snap naturally. So with this transition, the upper object's got a bigger circumference. I'm just going to radiate, radiate the geometry out like this uh, and use the lines that we do have already. I'm just going to finish this section. So with those options, if we look in, I'll just look from the side and make sure that that silhouette's working nicely. So you want to look at as many uh, different angles as possible. So there are more options you have here. So say, for example, we didn't need this seam that runs down, you know, this sort of like construction line. It's totally okay to turn this into a triangle and then combine those together. And that's just being efficient with the amount of geometry we're using. In this example, it might be an idea just to keep the one we already had. I mean, the silhouette's sort of working with this curve. It's a little bit more broad, um, but if you wanted a bit nicer resolution, we could introduce it. In honesty, it's actually not doing much to the silhouette. So I would take preference of combining those together. On the side, obviously this curves quite tightly. So you want to keep as much geometry there. It also works conversely. So say for example, we wanted more edges along this line. Maybe we just like a really smooth curve or the camera gets really close to that area because it's around the neck. We can put more loops on this side and have them terminate into nothing over here. So the way I'd sort of approach that is just delete these two and then hold control and then we can put additional loops in. It's not working too much here because the, the curvature is not that much, but it puts cost concept. I then repair this area and basically with each vertice, I'd hold tab, bring it down and we can just make a bunch of tries or quads depending on which one's the closest. So now we've got an arrangement like this where we've got come up here, which are holding the, the curvature of the silhouette, but then they split off into two and then they support broader geometry. So that's how you can basically approach and the methods that you go through. Now back to an original point, because we've been dem demonstrating all these things down here, we're starting to get quite a lot of vertical season edges. If we had done this in its entirety, we wouldn't have to basically drag out all these individual polygons. Um, and that's a trap I see a lot of my students fall into. So just make sure that you complete everything in its broadest, you know, like uh, almost like phone resolution, low poly, all the loops afterwards. On top of that, and that being said, um, while you are adding loops, obviously loops aren't going to go through a triangle. So I'd like to add all my loops first before I start to optimize and bring stuff together. So for example, maybe it would have been better that we inserted a loop and then just had that and then did a third pass of optimization. So we came back into here and then just started to drag some of them together. So that just gives you an option. So you always have availability for adding loops. Okay, so control one is going to bring all our assets back. So at this point, you might find that a couple of your low polys don't interact with other objects that well. So say, for example, um, we got a bit of overlapping here um, or it's going inside. At that point, you would start to add loops and just fix those areas because the low poly is going to be the most important thing and how they look together. If you are getting a bit of cutting or it's not transitioning well, I wouldn't move anything. I would just bake it straight. And then when it comes to the low poly and the final game res, you would just make tiny tweaks and adjustments where the face starts to bleed into each other. Here's a key example of where the second object isn't interacting too well with the low poly. So what I do is just add a couple of additional loops here, cut some geometry around this so the silhouettes working together nicely, like especially with the faces. With multi-cut, what I'll do is just find the closest vertice and then I'm going to lead it right to the edge 
bridge. I'm going to come down the length of the second object and reconnect it to the bottom vertice. And then when I press enter, it's going to snap back to um, the under mesh. Now with the quad draw, what I can do is just move these vertices. And if you see what we're doing is we're making a bit of a shelf and a transition. And it means that it's not um, it's not vanishing into its own mesh. The only thing is that um, quad draw is trying to overdraw. So it's better than it looks. Also remember, you can always come out a quad draw. So it's good to look at the underlying mesh and what it is. So with the low poly that we made, press control one, that's going to isolate it. And then I can click off or click on and see what geometry we have. So there you can see the little shelf that we made. So what I've done here is hidden the main strap guide and then hide, hit the latch here. And if we look the right side compared to the left side, the one that we've edited, the interaction's working and the silhouette's a little bit better. So looking at the game textures with the topology is a good way to understand it. So wherever there are two objects that are basically interacting with each other, we just want to sort those silhouettes out. So there are two additional tries here and here, and that's just sorting the silhouette. The seam here is also being protected by one single face. And we also have unwrap unwrapping options so we could straighten that up and then just use a texture to draw those out. Um, these could be probably done a little bit better but I'm not too fussed about that. Happy to put it into the game. You'll see that there is um, an interaction between the zip and the floating zip itself. So the zip tracks are connected to the lower geometry and then the zip itself is some floating geometry. So basically this interaction would be quite, but what it would involve is moving the vertices so they look nice on the low poly. Now the zip is here, but the way that the metal texture albedo is reading is black because it all comes through through reflectance. Um, but on the main mesh, you can see it. So here's the high poly. And obviously the zip's doing all the work when it comes to overlapping and silhouettes, but the zip is almost a part of the texture. So that's why we do it. If we come back to the low poly, I've just made this full bag guide and I'd show you how I draw across it. And it's really important to keep these almost perfectly straight and wherever it bends, um, you want to be making it parallel. I do in fact remember the artist that was making this like three or four times, uh, just saying like redo the zip, redo the zip, because um, we want to really maintain the textures here. The normal maps are going to be very important. If you imagine in the game, if the zip is expanding and closing, especially for a third person character. So spend a lot of time if you are protecting something like a zip, make Make sure that uh, there's a lot of geometry to support it, like especially if it's curving here. I just put some additional geometry in. If you are making, you know, further extensions to this low poly and it's feeling like a bit too much geometry, you can just drag them together and terminate it into something. Another trick to do if something's turning a little bit tight, obviously you can see on the outside the silhouette's not uh, that on this inside it's kind of okay. What I do is insert some loops and then I would just weld. It's going to create these sort of like uh, little radiating triangles and then that's going to support both the outside but it's going to be efficient. We've already hit a problem because these two weren't dynamesh together like we've done. I'm finding it hard to actually select um, the vertice here. So that's a common problem with students and they think that they're doing something wrong or either their mire is bugging out. But in actual fact, what it is, is their guide isn't that efficient like the way we had constructed it. Another fundamental is the necessity or the use of triangles. Um, I often hear people People go like, what's the try count with a character? And I, I say, you know, how long is a piece of string? But it's really important that there's no wastage. So for example, on the inside of the bag here, there's quite a lot of geometry. And while it is supporting, could be important from the side, there's certainly a lot of wastage on the inside. So feedback for the artist would could have been, you know, I'd like to see this a bit more optimized. But in terms of uh, just getting the work done and hitting deadlines, this is totally okay to put through. Just make sure you do an assessment of the mesh and make sure that the size of your polygons are related to how much you're going to see that asset. So it would be totally fine to actually just create three or four polygons across here maybe bridge it. So something like this shape would have been fine. Obviously from the side, we might see it a bit more. So what we could do is, and then make the uh, the silhouettes here quite strong with a lot of geometry. And then because we don't care too much about the inside, we can just weld these back into each other. And it might be tempting wherever you see a bit of a silhouette break, it could be tempting to just put loads of edges in there. What I do is just see if there's any other vertices that can, so I'm just going to take these and bring them to the side. And that means that's nice and efficient having good coverage of the silhouettes. You see, there's also a bit of curvature here. So each one of these adds curved down. So we might want to insert an additional loop here. Uh, when you get used to doing game characters, every curve that you make, that's going to be more work and more geometry for your low poly. So it's a good idea to sometimes think in both, you know, how can we simplify this high poly so we don't have an idea with these pads that we just make them nice and square. I've got lots of additional videos. It's quite a big topic, especially when it comes to real time characters and retopology and quad drawing. Um, I did have to skip across a couple of things, but in a future date, it might be nice to complete an entire essay and I can take you through that. So so if you enjoyed and got value out of it and also a lot of questions are coming through on the discord um, so if you have any video suggestions or troubles uh, either i or people on there can help you out i've also added a link uh, to free additional content so for example 
So make sure you're signing up to that. And that's basically where I send them out. So know when you're learning read topology, it can be a bit of a puzzle and frustrating, but stick with it. It's a very useful skill to know. And at some point, I promise it does come quite fun, quite relaxing. You know, you can listen to a podcast, have some music on, you can just outsource it to someone else. So thanks for watching and I'll catch you on the next one.